I'm proud of her too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of our church too. Good job today, uh, David, Bobby. Uh, appreciate your words for our, our meditations. And, uh, I'm so proud of our church and the things that we can accomplish. But I know that we have so much more work to do. And we should never just say, okay, we've made it. We've got more work to do in this community and our own congregation to grow closer to God. I think, again, we're going to continue on with this series today. A good way to do that is to look at what Jesus says. And today we're going to look at the words that Jesus said when he said, I am the way. He said this uh, probably right after um, a Passover meal. It was a few days after that, that day of the triumphal entry where he came in and they put the palm branches down in front of him. We're right around that same timeline. Uh, but he, he looks at his disciples today and he says, I am the way. It's a pretty wonderful promise when you really stop to think about it for a minute. <coughs> but, but Christ gave us more than promise than just say, I am the way. He also said this right before it. John chapter 14 is where we're going to be today. Let's start with verse 1 through 4. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that? I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. That's a pretty wonderful promise indeed. Now if you look at the King James Version, it's going to say that our Father's house, my Father's house, has many mansions. In my father's house, there are many mansions. The fact is, though, bottom line, what Christ is saying is there's room for everyone. For everyone. There's plenty of room. All you got to do is accept him. Now, look at this mansion here. Let's think about this for a second. That's a pretty amazing house right there. This house was actually... Used to be just a little farm, a little ranch style house up on the hill. The guy sold it, and somebody who has a lot more money than any of us put together bought this land and built this house. This house was built about a mile from where I used to live in northern Kentucky. It stuck out a little bit. We were in the middle of the suburbs, and then here's this house. And then, of course, rumors start flying around who does this house belong to? We watched as they built it for a year, uh, a couple years. Uh, the rumors were uh, pretty crazy for a while. I got to be a baseball player, Joey Votto, with the Cincinnati Reds. He just signed a big contract. That ends up not being true. Ends up being some, some guy who owns a lot of real estate in the Bahamas decided to, to make this a, a summer home. And it was, it was awesome. Just amazing. There's room in there for probably all of us to go in there and, and have our own space and have our own kitchen and bathroom. And it's, Awesome. There's a pool in the middle. There's a pool on the outside. He's got enough room for like 40 cars, I think they said, underneath it. And he's got his own pond that they built right there in front. Pretty amazing stuff. But let me tell you one thing. I live just a few blocks from this. And you know how many times they invited me over? Zero. Zero. Zero times where we asked to come over and have dinner. Zero times that he said, hey, come on, we got plenty of room. But here's Christ giving us this wonderful promise. He's telling us there's not only room, there's room enough for many, many mansions for, for everyone to come. To everyone to come to my Father's house. That's pretty personal, isn't it? Have you ever invited anybody over to your house? I mean, you don't necessarily just invite any stranger off the street. Usually it's someone you know, someone you're comfortable with. Someone maybe that you know will eventually leave too, right? <laughs> or, or know when the time might be. This is a very personal thing that Jesus has given them, them, giving them this invitation to say, come on to my father's house. You know the way. There's room for everyone. But then old Thomas, old Thomas the doubter, or doubting Thomas as we come to know him, a very faithful man, no doubt, but scripture records him as always having, saying a, uh, having a, a but. But what about this, Lord? And this time he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lord. You just said we know the way. He says, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Like talking about like a Debbie Downer right there. And the Lord's just said, hey, there's many mansions. There's enough room. Everybody come. And Thomas says, wait a minute. We have no idea where you're going. Um, um, wow. Thanks. 
But he really didn't get it. Even after all the time that he had spent with Jesus, after all the time that the disciples had spent with him over the previous three, three and a half years, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They didn't know where he was going or how they could get there. You've got you to gotta believe that Jesus, he might have been a little aggravated at this point. Like, man, here we go again. I've explained it to them, and yet they still don't understand. But as always, when Jesus is teaching us, he teaches us very patiently. And he says to them, I am the way. Let's look at John 14, 6 now. We're going to break this verse up today. And the first part of John 14, 6, Jesus told him, Thomas, the other disciples, I am the way. Pretty simple enough. How do we get there? I am the way. Have you ever had to stop and ask for directions? It's not the easiest thing for any of us to do. And guys, we get a bad reputation because no one wants to stop and ask for directions. We want to think that we know the way. You know, one of the most aggravating things that I used to have, so a little pet peeve of mine that I've, I've gotten over as I've grown older and more mature, I used to really get aggravated when someone would give me instructions for something that I already knew how to do. You ever had that happen? Somebody come up and they want to tell you how to mow your yard. I know how to mow my yard. Thank you very much. But people are just trying to help. Really, though, when we stop to ask for directions, a lot of times we need to think about who are we asking? What is our source here? This guy's not going to get very far. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. But who are we going to stop and ask? We're going to stop and ask maybe a police officer or a fireman, or someone that works at a store. If you are in, uh, if you are, if you are in Indiana and you see somebody with Missouri license plates, probably not going to be who you stop to ask. They may or may not know the directions of what's going on. Or maybe how? How are you going to ask for directions or for what? Maybe not just physical directions, maybe directions to how to do something. Stopping to ask for directions usually isn't the easiest thing. You know, I remember one time I was on my way to Chicago, and we got a little bit lost in a little town called Gary, Indiana. Probably wasn't the best part of the country. We'll just leave it at that. I'm sure there's some nice areas of Gary. I don't think I was in that area. And there was a lot of people around, and my buddy was in the back seat, but the map all pulled out, really making it obvious that we were lost. And I was even like, man, just put that down. We're going to be okay. We're going to find our way out of here. There's some signs up here. About this time, a big, a big rig, a trucker pulled up next to us and rolled down his window and said, you guys lost? Now, my first instinct is to say, no, I don't know you. What are you trying to do? But I thought some of the things that my dad told me about how truck drivers look out for each other and whatnot. I said, well, we don't exactly know where we're at. He said, well, let me tell you, you're in a bad part of town. Follow me. I will lead you to the highway. And my friend in the back said, no, no, don't follow him. He's going to lead us down some back alley and kill us. <laughs> I said, no, we're, we're not going to get ourselves in that situation. Let's just follow him. And sure enough, he led us right to the highway. We didn't even have to stop and ask. And see, that's the thing about us with our relationship with the Lord. We don't even have to stop and ask. He's already giving us directions. And we just care to stop and listen to him. And today he's telling us he is the way. He's the way. And I say, praise God, that way is clearly marked. Psalm 119.105 tells us that. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The way is clearly marked. Now, maybe it's not as obvious as a, a lighted street. Maybe it's just a matter of us following the path of righteousness. Following what the word, the word, that Bobby spoke of in John chapter 1, verse 1, the word told us to do, tells us to do. Maybe it's a matter of making sure that we stay on the path that Christ has laid before us. Do the right thing. Obedience. Follow him. Follow him because he is the way. In Isaiah 35, 8, they talk a little bit about a certain way. It says, he will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will only be for those who walk in God's ways. Are you on the highway of holiness? We should be, as Christians, we most certainly should be trying to be on this highway of holiness. It's not always easy. 
The Lord said that the, the path is narrow. Is this the path he was talking about? This highway of holiness. Well, here's what we do know. The Lord is telling us that he is the way. And the only way that we have to reach that salvation. And we also know this. He's telling us the truth when he says that. He said, I am the truth. He not only said, I am the way. He also said, I am the truth. Also in John 14, 6, the second part. Now, speaking of truths, have you ever had something that you've heard somebody else say, or maybe on TV, on the internet, and you ever think, where did that come from? Like, how did, how did they get to that conclusion? I think we've all had that. Like, seriously, where, where, where are they coming up with this stuff? How do they, they think that that's what this meant to say? Well, it's because they didn't know what the truth was. They didn't, they didn't pay attention to what the Lord had said. They didn't pay attention to what Scripture said. Let me give you an example. Right now, probably only a few of you here think they know the color of my socks. Last Sunday night, Sam Shockley had it figured out. Now, he doesn't know what kind of socks I have on today. He doesn't, for sure. He might have a good idea, though. Now, if he's told any of you today, I know exactly... For sure, it's a fact what kind of socks the preacher has on. He has just stretched the truth maybe a little bit. He doesn't know for a fact. I haven't shown him. But chances are he does know. Chances are he's learned enough about me to know what kind of socks I have on today. Sam, what kind of socks do you think I have on today? He is absolutely right. My Duke socks, I have to wear them on game days. It's just me. It's just me. Now he knows that for a fact. Now he has seen them. You guys can see them too if you want. They're, they're my Duke socks. Now he knows that for a fact. So now if he tells you that, there'd be complete truth about it. But what about people when it comes to the Scripture? What about people when it comes to the Word of God? There's sometimes we like to add things that aren't necessarily there. We shouldn't add anything. This is God's book. This is the Holy Word of God. We can't say that it says something if it doesn't. But... On the same hand, we cannot take away from it. We cannot subtract. We can't say, ah, that's not exactly what it means. Whenever it is clearly marked and the path is clearly lit. So where did that come from? What about cults? What about uh, places that use other Bibles? It's not clearly marked. And you think, where did they get that? Well, where they get, where, I can tell you where they didn't get it. The Scripture. The Word of God. Again, the path is clearly marked. See, we've got to know what the truth is about our, our Word of God. We've got to know what the truth is that He is giving us. He said He is the way. He said He is the truth. And it's our responsibility to know what this good book says. Because why? Because like John 8.32 says, we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. This truth that is established by God through His knowledge, through the miracles, through His authority, and through His Word. And what is our responsibility again? Something that we should ask God every single day. Lord, teach me. Psalm 86, 11. Teach me Your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to Your truth. Grant me purity of heart so that I may honor You. I think every day we need to have this prayer. Teach me your ways, Lord. Help me to understand the truth. Help me to understand the way. Help me to understand that truth leads to life. Which is the next thing that the Lord says. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In John 14, 6. But when he says I am the life, he's not talking about just truth. Here, just eternally. He's talking about now and eternally. Sometimes we want to think when we hear this verse that Christ is only talking about eternal life. Now, he most certainly is. He most certainly is talking about eternal life. But he's also talking about our lives <coughs> now. Because we know that with Christ in our hearts, our lives are better here, right now. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's always going to be perfect. 
That doesn't mean that there's not ever going to be anything bad that happens in our lives. But it does mean that no matter what happens in our lives, it's better because we have Christ in it. Can I get an amen to that? I want to know that you know this. I want to know that you know the simple fact that with Christ in our hearts, man, things are better. Things can be awesome. And just think, just think of how much better they're going to be. Think of how much more awesome it's going to be when we go to that second part, eternally. See, the Lord loves us so much, so much that we can't even really fathom or begin to understand how much He loves us. He loves us so much that He took that beating that Bobby talked about. He loves us so much that He went to that cross. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come to Jerusalem. He could have hightailed it out of there. But what did He do? He went to that cross for you, for me, for us, for everyone. Why? Because there's plenty of room in His Father's house. This is how much He loves us, says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand. <coughs> In the second part of the verse on the next slide. As understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete in all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. How wide, how long. How high, how deep His love is. Now, Scripture has said we should understand, as all God's people should, but it concludes with, it is too great to understand fully. I think it's our responsibility as Christians, as people of faith, as believers, to try our best to at least get a grasp how much God truly loves you. We also have to understand that we can never understand fully. We can never understand the magnificent thing that He did for us. We're talking about Christ hanging out up in His Father's mansions where there's plenty of room, where everything's perfect, and leaving that place to come here just to show us how wide, long, high, and deep His love is. Just to give us that reconciliation. Just to give us that way be invited to be with Him forever. I think that's awesome. Which is why we need to look at the rest of this verse. Because He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. He is also the only way there. There's no other way to salvation than Jesus. There's no other way at forgiveness than what He did for us. One, one question I've been asked so many times in my ministry. Why did Christ have to die there was no other way for us to have reconciliation. We could not do it ourselves. We had failed. Mankind had failed. So God had to come to earth as a man to do it for us. To give us that reconciliation. To give us that forgiveness. There was no other way. And there is no other way than Jesus. Not Buddha. Certainly not Muhammad. Not any kind of Eastern religions, not any kind of ancestral faiths. There's only one way at eternity through Christ. And if anybody doubts that, then you're not understanding the truth about what the Scriptures say. The Bible tells us to love. It doesn't tell us that that means that we have to accept and, and say that it's okay every other way. No, there's one way. The rest of the verse says this. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. No one can come to the Father except through Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why it's so important that we know Christ. That's why it's so important that we know that he is the way, he is the truth, and that he is the life. That is why it is so important that we look at this verse and we look at that last sentence. From now on, let's know Him. But don't you see Him? 
Don't you see him and don't you feel him in your heart? Don't you see what he can accomplish, not just through our own church, but worldwide? Because there's room enough for all of us. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for giving us room in your Father's house. We thank you for inviting us to your Father's house. Lord, we're so sorry that we don't always understand. It'd be so easy, Lord, for us to criticize Thomas and say, why did thou? But Lord, I know that we all go through the same things that Thomas has. Lord, help us to know and trust your way. Help us to know and trust your truth. And Lord, thank you for the gift that you have given us that we call life, both now and eternally. Lord, we know that you are the only way. That your sacrifice was the only way. Help us not to disregard this gift. Help us instead to take advantage of it. Help us, Lord, to go and to share this good news of forgiveness. Each and every day of our lives, Lord, help us to live your way with your truth in our hearts, that truth that sets us free. Lord, right now I ask a blessing upon each and every person here today. Help us to know, Lord. Help us to be confident, Lord. Help us to be bold, Lord, in our faith in you. Lord, we ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name.